All right, well, this morning we are going to continue in a series that I have uh, begun, Making Our Case for Yeshua the Messiah. We are learning about why we believe Yeshua is the promised Messiah of Israel. We are learning how to make a case for Him, and uh, we've been looking, first of all, at the uh, Messianic prophecies throughout the Scriptures that speak about the Messiah, and how the Messiah Himself fulfills the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And so we've been going through the Torah and looked at a number of verses throughout the Torah that speaks about the Mashiach, the Messiah. We have started now looking at the prophets, and we have been seeing what the prophets say about Yeshua the Messiah. And then later we'll move on to the writings. These are the three sections of the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Kituvim. As Yeshua said in Luke 24, verse 44, He said, These are My words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything written concerning Me in the Torah of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And He opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And this is what we're asking God to do, is open up our minds. For those of us who are believers, yes, we've had a revelation of God. He has opened up our minds. Uh, but He also wants to continue to reveal Himself to us and to teach us. But we're praying too that God would open up the minds of many people out there, including our Jewish people, who need to hear that Yeshua is the promised Messiah of Israel. So we're looking at Messianic prophecies. We're trying to answer some Jewish objections to faith in the Messiah, and we are hearing some testimonies. I hope you enjoyed Mark Polonsky's testimony a couple of weeks ago, and we'll hear some more as we go along. And so today, I'm moving from the prophets, uh, sorry, the prophet Isaiah to the prophet Zechariah. And uh, we'll stay in the book of Zechariah for a little while. Now let's first of all look at who is Zechariah. Well, first of all, Bible scholar George Robinson has called the book of Zechariah the most messianic, the most truly apocalyptic and eschatological of all the writings of the Old Testament. The most messianic, he thinks. And I think it's true. The messianic emphasis of Zechariah is why this book of Zechariah is most frequently quoted in the Brit Chadashah, the New Testament. There are 41 citations or allusions to the prophecy of Zechariah in the New Testament. Zechariah, who was he? Well, he was a Levite from the tribe of Levi, born in Babylon. So born in Babylon while the Israelites were in, uh, in exile. He is the son of Berechiah and the grandson of Edo the priest. So like Jeremiah and also like Ezekiel, Zechariah was both a prophet and a priest. Zechariah, uh, his name means Yahweh remembers. Zechariah was a contemporary of Haggai the prophet, Zerubbabel the governor, and he was a contemporary of Joshua the high priest. Uh, in the book of Ezra, if you have a look there, and Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah returned as a young man to Jerusalem from Babylon with uh, about 50,000 other Jewish exiles in 538 B.C., after having been in exile for 70 years, although he wasn't 70 years old, he was born in exile and came to Jerusalem. And Zechariah began his prophetic ministry, encouraging the people to spiritual renewal. He was a revivalist, if you like. And he was motivating the people to rebuild the temple of God, and also he was used by God to reveal God's plans for the nation of Israel in the future. And with this prophetic encouragement, the people completed the temple reconstruction in 515 uh, before the Messiah, B.C. Zechariah not only encouraged the Jews to rebuild the temple, but his prophecies was all, very much also a vision for the future kingdom of Israel under the rule of King Messiah. Zechariah looked forward to the coming of King Messiah and the future spiritual restoration of the people of Israel, and hence also 
the redemption of the world because when the Messiah comes, he will bring redemption not just for Israel, but the whole world. So let's have a look at his prophecy, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 and 10 that we are going to first look at. Lovely words. There's a beautiful song that our worship team do know that go towards these word, go for these words. Gili meod bat Zion, harii bat Yerushalayim. Hinei malkech yavor lach tzadik venoshahu, ani verochev al chamor ve'al ayeh ben atonot. Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. What a beautiful prophecy. And so here in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 10, we see Melech HaMashiach, Melech, King Messiah, Melech Mashiach revealed to Israel, yet he is shrouded in paradox because he is exalted, yet he is humbly riding a donkey. Can you imagine a great king coming into Jerusalem or any other city of the world riding a VW Beetle instead of a Bentley or Rolls Royce. That's this picture here. It's shrouded in paradox. This is the King Messiah who brings salvation to Israel and peace to the whole world. The question is, does he do this at the same time? Bring salvation and then peace to Israel at the same time? Well, no. Zechariah chapter 9 verses 9 to 10 is one of those categories of prophecies where, the f where there are uh, two parts to it. The first coming of the Messiah and the second coming of the Messiah in the same passage without obvious distinction. Verse 9 relates to the first coming of the Messiah while verse 10 refers to the second coming of the Messiah. We know this by studying other passages of Scripture, even though it's not clear in this text itself. So we, two, we see two events blended together. Well, this is something like when you're looking out on a vista of mountains. When you're looking out from one vantage point, and you can see the mountains that are right before you, and it seems like they are quite close, and the mountains right behind is also seems like it's rather close. Yet when one climbs the first mountain, you discover that there's a vast valley between the two peaks. And so it is with the prophets of Israel. From their perspective, they saw two events that looked like, from their perspective, almost as one event. Yet from our perspective now, in history, we can see that there is a significant time between the two events and these two distinct missions of the Messiah between the first and second coming of the Messiah. Of course, uh, when you take a photograph of mountains using a, tele, a telephoto lens, that kind of effect is, of course, uh, increased. So, let's have a look at these two events. The first event is in verse 9. The coming of the Prince of Peace. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The, verse, the verses that actually run up to this prophecy from uh, chapter 9 verses 1 to 8 speak about an invasion of Israel by a foreign king. Most commentators say that those verses 1 to 8 were fulfilled by the conquests of Alexander the Great through uh, the area of Palestine after the Battle of Issus in 333 BC, which is about 200 years after Zechariah's prophecy. So 
the first part of the chapter is speaking about something that had not yet happened. Zechariah was prophesying the coming of a Greek invader. And so amazingly, Zechariah, living in the days of the Medo-Persian Empire, predicted the coming of the Grecian Empire. And then he also predicted the coming of the Roman Empire, actually in chapter 11, verses 4 to 14, and also the future restoration of, uh, of Israel in the last days, which uh, in his prophecy uh, is chapters 12 to 14. But in verse 9, in contrast to this invading Greek king, we have a promise of a future Jewish king. Israel is told to rejoice because this is their king, King Messiah, and he's coming to you, not against you. And they can receive this king without fear and with much rejoicing, Gili Meod. This is the same King Messiah as prophesied by Isaiah the prophet. In chapter 9, verses 6 to 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so that uh, was fulfilled wonderfully through the birth of Yeshua the Messiah, as announced by the angel Gabriel. Gabriel said in, chapter, in Luke chapter 1, verse 32, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, speaking of Yeshua the Messiah. And we've looked at those prophecies earlier on in the series. Now we know that Alexander the Great was sexually perverse and he died in a drunken stupor. In contrast, Zechariah says that Israel's King Messiah would be righteous. That is, his reign will be characterized by justice and personal righteousness, as Isaiah the prophet also earlier prophesied. Let's look at another prophecy from Isaiah that uh, lends itself to Zechariah. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. What a beautiful description of the Messiah and what a beautiful description of Yeshua the Messiah. Going back to Zechariah 9.9, 9, the phrase there it says, he shall, uh, he shall uh, ha he'll have salvation uh, with him, or having salvation is he in the ESV version. It speaks about the fact that the Messiah will come to Israel as a deliverer, one who will bring salvation to others. This is also in contrast to Alexander the Great, who came in conquest with much destruction uh, of the earth. Zechariah also says, in contrast to other kings, Israel's king Messiah will be humble and gentle. And his humility is shown by the fact that he doesn't come to Jerusalem in a white steed, but rather riding a colt, the foal, literally the son of a donkey. Typically a foal of a donkey that had never been ridden before. And so uh, it's a, a wonderful term uh, where it says that he shall be humble. It's the Hebrew word ani. And this morning in uh, the first service, we looked at that word. So if you have time, make sure you look at the first service too. It comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 2, where God calls us to be humble as well. It's the Hebrew word ani. The Messiah himself was humble and uh, didn't come as a, a pompous king into Jerusalem, but came on a a foal of a donkey. In ancient Near East culture, riding on a donkey 
is a sign that you're coming in peace rather than on a war stallion, for instance. The fulfillment of this prophecy is found in the Gospels in the Brit Hadashah as Yeshua's triumphant, triumphant entry into Jerusalem at the beginning of his last week of his life. Let's read the fulfillment of this chapter, of this prophecy in Matthew 21. Now, as they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Yeshua sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village before you. Right away you'll find a donkey tied up and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, shall say, The Master needs them. And right away he will send them. Have you tried that before? You know, go out and you know, open up the door of a Lamborghini. So the master needs it. The master needs it. I don't think it'll work, but certainly this was a prophecy, and it did work. This happened to fulfill what is spoken through the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king is coming to you, humble and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Yeshua had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their clothing on them. He sat on the clothing. Most of the crowd spread their clothing on the road, and others began cutting branches from the trees, spreading them on the road. The crowds going before him, and those following kept shouting, saying, Hoshiana to Ben David, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hoshana in the highest. Hoshana. It's not a chorus. Hoshana is a cry for salvation. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowds kept saying, this is the prophet Yeshua from Nazareth in the Galilee. Then when the, this is when the Messiah King was revealed to Israel. Jerusalem, behold your king. Yerushalayim, hinei malchech yavor lach. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Not only was this a triumphant entry of Yeshua into Jerusalem, but it was a, a little minor miracle of itself that the foal of a donkey that had never had anyone on it before didn't buck Yeshua off. Zechariah 9.10 the second part of the prophecy where we see the kingdom of the Prince of Peace. First it was a revelation of the, king, of the Prince of Peace, the coming king. Now the kingdom itself says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the, the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. So the first reason for rejoicing is the coming of the Prince of Peace. The second reason to rejoice is the establishment of the kingdom of the Prince of Peace. This is a kingdom of universal peace in Israel and among the nations and universal sovereignty. Again, in contrast with Alexander's empire that was founded on bloodshed, the Messianic king will establish a universal kingdom of shalom, of peace. The cutting off the, of the chariot, the war horse, and the battle bow is in line with the idea that when the Messiah comes, all the implements of war will either be destroyed or be used as farming equipment, as the prophet Isaiah also and Micah concur. Micah chapter 4 verse 3 tells us, He shall judge between many peoples, speaking of the Messiah, and he shall decide disputes for, the strong, for strong nations far away, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. What a wonderful picture of future peace that will come upon the world when the Messiah will rule from his throne in Jerusalem. Going back to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. The chariot, the war horse, and the battle bow represent the whole arsenal used in ancient warfare. So the passage speaks about the time when the Messiah will destroy all weapons of war. Can you imagine how prosperous this world would be if we didn't spend all that money, trillions and trillions of dollars yearly on war or even defense? Can you imagine where we're using all that uh, money for 
the prosperity of the people, for providing food for everyone, housing. So that will be the time of the millennium, when the Messiah will rule. This is speaking about Yeshua's second coming, when he'll return to bring peace to Israel and to the whole world, the reign of, uh, and reign on the throne of his father David, and to rule in peace, righteousness, and justice for 1,000 years, which we call the Messianic Age. Zechariah says that not only will there be a disarmament and peace in Israel, but the Messianic King will also proclaim peace to all the nations. This is itself a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. When God said to Abraham, I'll bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, and through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. So the whole world is going to be blessed through Israel's Messiah. The Messiah came in fulfillment of this Abrahamic covenant, and indeed he came and proclaimed peace to Jews and Gentiles, as Rabbi Shaul tells us. And he came and he preached peace to you who are far off the nations, and peace to those who are near the Jews. And Zechariah tells us that this peaceful rule of the coming Messianic king will extend from sea to sea and from the river. What river? river? The river Euphrates to the ends of the earth. Really, this is an expression that indicates the Messiah's peace and his rule will be universal. And so in verses 9 and 10, we are presented again what we have called, and we've spoken about this a few times before now, the Messianic Paradox. We have two perspectives, perspectives of, uh, of prophecy uh, st standing side by side in the passage. How can the same Messiah be humble and lowly and yet come as a great messianic king who brings peace to Israel and to the whole world? And let me tell you that this is one of the uh, objections that many Jewish people have. They'll say, how can you believe in Yeshua as the Messiah when he did not bring peace to the world as the Messiah was meant to be? And so here is part of our answer. When the ancient rabbis looked at these two seemingly contradictory prophecies, they reconciled them by saying that there'll be two different messiahs. We've talked about this before. The first would be Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah son of Joseph. He would come and fulfill all the passages about the suffering and, hu and the uh, humility of the messiah. Then it would be followed by Mashiach ben David, Messiah son of David, who would come as the great conquering king messiah. This passage of Zechariah has always been considered, in fact, as messianic by the rabbis. So we're looking at a passage that is understood as to be a, a prediction of the Messiah by the rabbis, and we can see this from some quotes from the Talmud. In Sanhedrin 98b, it says, Rabbi Halel said, Israel can expect no Messiah because they consumed him in the days of Hezekiah. The retort, when did Hezekiah live? Was it not in the days of the first temple? Yet Zechariah, during the time of the second temple, prophesied and said, and it goes on to quote Zechariah 9, 9, Behold, your king comes to you, humble and riding a donkey, etc. Also then, in Pesikta 53, it says, This refers to Messiah. He is called Ani, lowly because he was oppressed all these years in prison, and the sinners of Israel denied him. For the merits of the Messiah, the Holy One, blessed be he, will protect, will protect and redeem you. So these are kind of obscure quotes. If you don't understand how the Talmud works, they seem kind of odd kind of explanations. But we're just showing that the rabbis believed that this verse was speaking about the Messiah. How they explained it, we may not agree with, but it just shows us it's a messianic passage. Again in the Talmud, in Sanhedrin 98a, it says, Rabbi Joseph, the son of Levi, objects that it is written in one place, Behold, one like the Son of Man comes in the cloud of heaven. But in another place it is written, Lowly and riding upon an ass. The solution is, if they, the people, be righteous, he shall come with the clouds of heaven. But if they are not to be righteous, he shall come lowly, riding upon an ass. And this last quote from the Talmud actually is still a belief that's held by Orthodox Judaism, even Hasidic Judaism today, that if Israel, the current generation of the Jewish people, 
are righteous, the Messiah will come in the clouds of heaven as King Messiah. However, if Israel is unworthy, if the Jewish people are unworthy, the Messiah will come as Mashiach ben Yosef uh, and come lowly and riding on a donkey. Actually, this was also thought about as Rebbe Schneerson. Remember, I spoke in the early days of this series, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson thought to be the Mashiach by the Lubavitch movement. When he got sick and eventually when he died and failed to fulfill the expectations of his followers, they said the reason that he was not revealed as Messiah to the world was because you didn't deserve it. You weren't righteous enough. You didn't do enough good deeds and acts of kindness, and so the Messiah was not revealed. So that's how they explain things. This view is also held, as we noted last week, by Rambam, the well-known medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher and rabbi, explained that there must be different stages in the revelation and acceptance of the Messiah. A quote, first, Messiah himself realizes that the time has come, then he starts to communicate this to others. At first, this excites only the ridicule, as Zechariah 9.9 states, that he will be poor and riding on a donkey. At this stage, he suffers pain and illness, but his acceptance of this causes God to reward him with great length of days forever and with completion of the redemption when he will teach all nations to know God. Interesting. Of course, this is not the Bible. This is rabbinic uh, commentary, but how there are different stages. The Messiah comes first and is rejected, then he comes second and is accepted and brings peace to the whole world. Now, the messianic and the biblical viewpoint is that the Messiah would not be two different people, that he'll be one Messiah that comes twice to the world. First, he comes to, uh, and he's revealed to Israel. He's rejected by his very own people. He's handed over to the Gentiles. He suffers and dies and is crucified. And uh, this fulfills the ministry of Mashiach ben Yosef. When Messiah returns a second time, he comes as Mashiach ben David, as the glorious and exalted king to rule over the world from his throne in Zion. So we have one Messiah who comes twice to fulfill two seemingly contradictory prophecies. This Zechariah 9, 9 to 10, is fulfilled through Yeshua of Nazareth. So what does this mean for us today? Well, first of all, these prophecies... In these prophecies, we see the providence of God in the promise of the Messiah. God providentially directed the affairs of humankind to fulfill his redemptive purposes for this world. And this tells us that God is in control of this world, and nothing will stop his plans for this world from being fulfilled. So when we think of the providence of God, think about the world we're living in today. Lots of craziness going on uncertainty, changes of plans all the time, uh, COVID-19, viruses, responses to the viruses, conspiracy theories, all the things that are going on in this world. Everyone's going a little bit crazy, but don't forget that the, in the providence of God, God has this world in his hands. It's not out of control. He will fulfill his purposes, and it's been fulfilled. We have to just continue to trust him and believe in him. Secondly, we can be assured that our faith is founded upon sure foundations. The word of God has stood the test of time. We can see prophecy that is given hundreds, year, hundreds of years earlier than then it was later fulfilled. And so we can see that Yeshua is the promised Messiah of Israel. Thirdly, we who are believers in Yeshua the Messiah, we are called to be his disciples. We are called to emulate him, to be like him in this world. In this prophecy, we've seen that Messiah is righteous. So should we live righteously in relationship to one another. The Messiah was humble, ani. We need to be humble if we're going to come into God's presence. And he came with salvation. And so should we come with a message of salvation found in the Messiah. And he spoke peace to the nations. We are called to be ambassadors of God's peace to this world. We are called to bring the message of God's salvation to Jew and Gentile alike, looking forward to the day when 
the kingdom of this Messiah will become a reality in and around the whole world. The Messiah will come and reign the whole world from his throne in Jerusalem. And so it says, He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this uh, wonderful message from the prophet Zechariah. Lord, reveal it to us further. Open our hearts to it, Lord. We thank you for the truth found in your scripture. Help us to learn and grow and help us to be able to share these truths with those that need to hear about the salvation in this King Messiah. So this I pray, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.